Let us pray. Lord, on this Trinity Sunday, we come to see you, to hear you, to know you better. Come into our hearts, our minds, and our lives when we go from this place. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Today, as you see on the header at the front of your bulletin, today in the Christian calendar is Trinity Sunday. Sorry, not about us so much as it is about the Holy Trinity. This is always the Sunday after Pentecost, but it has a really different origin story from Pentecost. If you all were here last week, we celebrated that day so joyfully together. That original Pentecost day was the miraculous experience of the Holy Spirit, letting people hear about God when they otherwise could not understand each other. Trinity Sunday, on the other hand, did not start with the miraculous experience of the Trinity. It exists because the church has always struggled to understand the Trinity. We worship and follow and pray to a triune God. Our children talk about the Trinity in Sunday school and confirmation. Our elders write about the triune God in their faith statements. The names, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit roll easily off our tongues in a threesome. But Scripture doesn't use the word Trinity. There is no passage that spells out for us how the Divine One can exist as three persons, all equally God, equally present for all eternity. So interpreters have been fighting about this for what feels like all of eternity, trying to glean from Scripture how to define the divine. Several times in history, the church split over what it believes about the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, Rock, Savior, Friend. That search for understanding of the Trinity has produced a fantastic series of heresies over time. Some of them are that God exists in different modes, like three different personalities. That heresy was called modalism. That each person of the Trinity is only one-third God, or God works in shifts, one person at a time. That was called partialism. The Trinity is actually three gods, tritheism. Jesus was never actually God, ebionitism, or was never actually human. Docetism and Arianism both said a version of that. And that the OG, here that means original God, is at the top of the chain and made or adopted the other two as sub-gods. Adoptionism, Macedonianism, and Arianism again. Nope, all heresy. Three in one, and one in three means amazingly, mysteriously, that God is three persons who are all fully God, fully in the world at all times, inseparable, equal, divine. When we stop to think about that, we see just how hard it is to understand and why the church fought about it for so long that in 1911, a whole feast day was dedicated to our triune God. That's today. There are only a handful of passages in the whole Bible that talk about all three persons of the Trinity, and today's scripture from the Gospel of John is one of them. As you'll hear, it's a conversation between Jesus and a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a bit of an enigma. Some have made him out to be a secret follower of Christ. Some call him a buffoon who just couldn't get the lessons he was being offered. But whatever his reason, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night, thus the secret follower bit, to try to understand what Jesus is teaching. Without meaning to create a doctrine, Jesus talks about the three persons of the Trinity. He talks about the kingdom of God, the salvation to come and the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the uncontainable movement of the Holy Spirit. This reading is a long one. It will end with two very familiar verses, but for the others, I invite you to follow along in your pew Bibles if you'd like. 
Our reading begins on page 93 in the New Testament and continues on to page 94. Hear now the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? How can anyone enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Don't be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said, how can these things be? Jesus answered, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we've seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I've told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus tells us some good stuff about the persons of the Trinity, even if Jesus didn't mean to teach that kind of lesson. For example, Jesus says that faith in God will require a person to take on a different life from any other faith they've had. They'll have to be born again, if you will, born as followers of a God who doesn't fit into old paradigms of religion and belief. Jesus also tells Nicodemus that the Spirit helps make that kind of faith possible. Just as we heard last week at Pentecost, the Spirit will move wherever it wants. It has the power to enliven someone in faith and draw them into community with God. And Jesus talks about his own divinity here. Without saying, hey Nicodemus, I'm God, Jesus talks about how no one has descended from heaven except the Son of Man, who will also return to heaven. He talks about the divine purpose and action, even if Nicodemus still doesn't understand what he means. God has become human to save the world. We can see why this scripture lands on Trinity Sunday. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. We learn something here about the persons of the triune God. But I wonder whether there's another lesson for us, Trinity, on Trinity Sunday. And that's not just about acceptable doctrine of the Trinity, but about the faith modeled in this conversation. I think Nicodemus is fascinating. He was a Pharisee, so he was a keeper of the orthodox religious practice that Jesus is now saying is not enough for the kingdom of God. Nicodemus comes to see Jesus at night, maybe because he's afraid to be seen with this rabble-rousing rabbi, maybe because he's already a follower in his heart but he can't go public, maybe because some of our deepest moments of curiosity and vulnerability happen in the dark. But Nicodemus comes 
he approaches Jesus with at least curiosity. He could have held the official line of his position as a Pharisee, as a leader of the Jews, but instead he seeks understanding. He seeks a relationship with this new teacher, maybe even inching toward his own confession of faith. Nicodemus is a person in a position to teach about God, but here we see that he is still learning about God. He doesn't get all the way to understanding. He certainly doesn't come away with a clear doctrine of the Trinity. Nicodemus has questions. How can anyone be born again? How can these things be? He must have seemed confused because Jesus tells him not to be astonished and tells him outright that he just doesn't understand. Now, it's human nature to reject the things we don't understand to ridicule them, and these days to simply say that they're wrong. But something else happens in this encounter. Nicodemus stays. He stays engaged, he stays curious, he asks questions, he seems genuinely to want to learn. The conversation ends without what we would call closure. We don't hear a final response, much less an affirmation of faith from Nicodemus. We're left trying to understand, as he surely was, but Nicodemus was somehow changed anyway. Perhaps it was the power of that unpredictable Holy Spirit. Perhaps it was the power of love, Jesus spoke. God so loved the world that God became human to save it. When Nicodemus appears again in John's Gospel, he seems to express faith he is advocating and caring for Jesus. Later, in chapter 7, temple authorities, those are Nicodemus' own peers, will come and arrest Jesus and take him away. And in that moment, it is Nicodemus who speaks up against them to say that Jesus should get a hearing before he is judged. And then, at the end of Jesus' earthly life, after his death on a cross, this teacher, Nicodemus, will come to the tomb with spices to anoint his body for burial. He comes to learn at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He speaks up for Jesus when he's under threat, and he takes on the most intimate role of care at the time of Jesus' death. I don't usually list points in sermons, but I'm going to today. Because as I reread this conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus this week, I heard three very clear reminders that I needed. I offer them to you all as well. The first is that we're still learning about God all the time. Doctrine can help connect us across time and geography. It can give us a vocabulary and keep us in the road in a topsy-turvy world. But we need to come to God with our curiosity with our open minds and our hearts hoping to be changed. Theology, that is, words about God, is often defined as faith-seeking understanding. Notably, there's no word for the end of that journey. It's the work of a whole life of faith to seek understanding. The second reminder is to keep ourselves open to the mystery of the divine. Nicodemus never got hard and fast explanations. He never fully understood God or Jesus or the Holy Spirit, but he was able to trust their divine work anyway. He didn't reject the divine power because it was beyond him. He seems to have understood that it was beyond him because it was divine. In one of his most quoted teachings, Augustine wrote, Si comprehendus, no est Deus. Roughly translated, this means, if you understand God, what you understand isn't God. On this day, that became a church day because of people defending their understanding of our triune God, in a world determined to throw out what we can't explain, may we never forget that God is bigger than we are, beyond our understanding. And may we experience that mystery 
as divine. And finally, this old conversation reminds us that whatever else we ascribe to God, God is love. The identity of the divine is love. The purpose of the divine is love. The action of the divine is love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn it, but in order that the world might be saved. In a few minutes, we will sing together one of the great hymns of our faith, written in 1747 by Charles Wesley. You current and former Methodists rejoice. <laughs> love divine, all loves excelling. We will sing together to the God who is love divine, the joy of heaven to earth come down. We will sing to our Lord Jesus, who is all compassion, pure, unbounded love, to visit us with salvation again, by the breath of the Spirit to enter our trembling hearts. Perhaps our miraculous experience of the Holy Trinity will happen today, as we remember that we are still learning about this wonderful mystery that loves us beyond our understanding. Thanks be to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>